we got a very, very, very special guest, uh, Mr. DeWitt Fleming Jr., who is going to be in a new play, world class, world premiere in Chicago, What a Wonderful World, which is a story, musical tribute to the great Louis Armstrong. Absolutely. Welcome to Chicago, oh, Mr. New you. Yorker. <laughs> Straight a... from the uh, Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Yes, Washington, D.C., uh, Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Yeah, Where you where... learn so much. Absolutely. Learn more than the arts. Learned, uh, you know, culture. Learned a lot of things. Yeah. So you are a percussionist? Yes. You are a tap dancer? Yes. You are an actor? Yep. <laughs> and more? A singer, of course. And a yeah. singer, yeah. of course. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. That's genius level. That's oh, a lot. I don't know. You know. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you've been on Broadway, and you've done some very interesting, well, innovative musical things. Yeah, you know, I've, I've traveled all over. I've been blessed to, you know, be able to perform and, and do things, you know, all over the world. So uh, I am very blessed and lucky to be able to do what I love. So let's talk about your new venture, your yeah. upcoming uh, what a Wonderful World, uh -huh. where you play the part of Lincoln Perry. Yes. And this show mm -hmm. is going to distill some stereotypes, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. tell us who Lincoln Perry was by another name. Oh, Lincoln Perry. Lincoln Perry, most people know him as Step and Fetch It. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was, uh, unfortunately, a lot of us know him, uh, and myself included, until I did the research uh, as a, um, a stereotype. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever that name is even mentioned, you get certain feelings. Mm -hmm. And I uh, remember, you know, hearing that name about this show, and I had to go do my research because I had these feelings, and I said, well, I got to find out who so, this man really was. So who he really was in a historical perspective, mm -hmm. he was really the first black actor in uh, Hollywood. Yes. And I'm, he yes. was the first to make a million dollars. First to make a million dollars, I mean, I mean, you're talking about early 1920s, you know. 1920s, 30s. Yeah, 1930s. And, and I mean, he was a brilliant mind, a very educated man. Mm. Um, he played a certain role, mm -hmm. which a lot of us knew, and at that time was something called putting on a mask. And, they, and, and what that meant was it, it, you play a certain way that people want you to play mm -hmm. in order to get what you need to get. Right. So it was so, a stereotypical role. It was a stereotypical role, but he was very masterful in the way he did it. Mm -hmm. The comedy that he did mm -hmm. and, and the way that he uh, was able to uh, uh, create this whole environment where the person that thought they were getting over on him, he was getting over on them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. How, how does he relate to Louis Armstrong? So he taught Louis Armstrong. He met Louis Armstrong in Hollywood. And in the show, we have a scene where he's teaching Louis how to make it in Hollywood. Hmm. How you have to turn on a, a certain face or a certain way of communicating, a certain way of performing in order to get by and get the things that you want. They were appealing to a white audience? Yes, of course. I mean, you're appealing to a white audience at that time. Um, the, the, the movie industry, uh, very much so like today, doesn't necessarily appeal to black audiences. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. but they were both very conscious that they were black. Oh, absolutely, 100%. I mean, what you see on camera is nothing of what was happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lincoln Perry would use to his advantage uh, what they thought he was to get more pay, to get uh, uh, writing credits, I mean, he was one of the highest paid actors and were actually paid more than some of the white actors at the time as well. Hmm. And so this, I mean, he was writing for the Chicago Defender that was right here in mm -hmm, Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know that because they wouldn't be reading a black publication. What was he, what, what was he writing? What kind of things was he, well, was he doing a lot entertainment of, writing? Yeah, entertainment writing. A lot mm -hmm. of things were reviews of shows and things of that nature. And of course he would talk about other, uh, small political things mm -hmm. um, but he, I mean he was he was a very educated man he's very smart in the way he moved and, and the things he did um, and he understood that you know as if he acted a certain way that he can get what he want mm -hmm. and not let them know how smart he was then they would open the door for him so he played what word do we use? I don't want to say the dummy, but he played himself down. He played himself down. He played himself down. And, and you know, again, this tactic, I mean, he was brilliant. He used it with the press. 
and the press loved it, so it made him even a bigger, bigger star. Mm -hmm. And then so that made him have a negotiating uh, position when he went to the Hollywood producers. Mm -hmm. Because the press loved him, everybody loved him, so when he went there, you know, he would play himself down, but then walk out of the door with a bigger salary. A bag full of money, huh? <laughs> a bag full of money, <laughs> you know. So he was, he was very smart, and, and again, his artistry, I mean, before he did Hollywood, he was doing uh, doing the silent films. And vaudeville. And vaudeville, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the rhythm and the way he used his body to communicate, even mm -hmm. in silent films, was just, I mean, so it was groundbreaking. He was playing the servant. He was always the servant in a servant role. Yeah, is that it was right? a, it, servant role. Um, different. It depended on the film, mm -hmm. uh, but different roles. But I mean, at that time, you know, that's what they that, offered. That's us. what you could play. That's what they offered. I mean, many people tried to, you know you know, create other roles for themselves and mm -hmm. things, and it just, it wouldn't happen. So he saw that and he said, well, how can we break through, mm -hmm. give them what they want, and on, while getting what we want at the same time. So yeah. let's talk about Louis Armstrong. Yes, um, yes. Because he too has been portrayed. Yeah, in absolutely. In a vein where he too kind of put himself down a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. And this man was a genius. Oh, he's a genius. He's we, a musical genius. Musical genius. Every and any music you hear today, we owe to him. I believe he, and he said it himself, McGraw and Brown were a dance group, a jazz and tap dance group that he played with. And he really wanted to mimic the steps that they were doing. With the trumpet. With the trumpet. And he wanted to compliment them more and it really informed the way he started to improvise and play music after that. And this is, I mean, this is as early as 1925, 26. Wow. You know, and so you see this stuff happening and then you see him start to develop this style. How'd you find the love for tap? Uh, the love for tap came for me in high school, my senior year at Duke Ellington. And uh, I was studying theater and we were learning musicals and I had to tap in this particular musical. Uh, and I started playing drums when I was 12 years old. So I already loved rhythms and drums. Mm -hmm. And when I saw tap dancing and I saw that you can do those same rhythms with your feet, I mean, I just fell in love and I became obsessed and I was in a dance studio late until they kicked me out after school and then I had a board in front of my television at home. And but you still carrying around, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Still carrying the board. Still carrying the board around, yeah, absolutely. Who's your favorite tap dancer? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh. That's hard. That's really hard. I mean, uh, I've been influenced by a lot of them. I mean, Gregory Hines, Bill Bojangles Robinson. Uh, uh, you oh, know, yeah. It's just, it's yeah. so many. Bunny Briggs. Is it, um, is it a dying art? No, it's very much so alive. Very much so alive. I mean, there was just a movie, uh, a, a Christmas movie with uh, Will Ferrell that had tap dancing all through it that just came out this uh, last year, mm. you know, choreographed by, you know, Chloe Arnold, you know, mm -hmm. she is really doing a great job at pushing tap into uh, mainstream. And Debbie Allen. And De well, she's a, a protege of Debbie Allen, mm -hmm. so she's working mm -hmm. with her out there. And then right here in Chicago, my good buddy Brill Barrett, you oh know, yeah, is doing amazing things with Mad Rhythm and pushing the art form out there and getting it in places and putting it back into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. when when people see mm -hmm. the Louis Armstrong musical tribute. Mm -hmm. What do you want them to leave with? What do you want them to yeah. know? I never heard the Lincoln Perry story right. with Armstrong, but once you said it, it clicked because right. it's just it just makes sense. It's right. just it logical. Yeah. But I think we're gonna break down some stereotypes. It's yes. kind of amazing now as we see the musical tributes being produced. Mm -hmm. We have to give our ancestors the credit that they mm -hmm. deserve. Mm -hmm. You know. We, having more access now, think sometimes can think we know more. Mm -hmm. But they knew, they understood, and they were able to persevere, and they were able to take their circumstances and create ways for us. Thank yeah. you so much Thank you. for being Thank with you. us, and yeah. uh, we, look, we look forward to seeing yeah. the play. World premiere, I'm so happy Absolutely. that the world premiere yes. is in Chicago. Absolutely. And then you yeah. go straight to Broadway. Yes. Thank you. What a wonderful Thank <laughs> you.